Hi, I'm Lily O'Donnell. Please remain standing as I read the Beatitudes from Matthew 5, 1 through 10. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Please be seated. Thank you, uh, Lois and Ethan, for leading us so well, and Lily for re reading. And you don't know this, but Lily just got engaged last week, so congratulations to Lily. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you saw the sparkle. <laughs> anyway, before we jump into the sermon this morning, I don't know if you're aware, perhaps you're, you haven't heard, but there, there's an election in two days in our nation. And I think it's... Um, it's good and right that we pause and acknowledge something. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, we're told, the Apostle Paul says, I urge then, first of all, that pray petitions, prayers, and intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for all kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior. So before we jump into the sermon, I just want to lead you in a prayer. In case you missed it, if you came in a little bit late, maybe you missed that we're having a prayer service tomorrow night at our South Street campus from 7 to 8. We'll gather and pray God's word for ourselves, for our church, and for our nation. But I want to pause right now as God's people gathered in this place to lead us through a prayer. You can follow along as I read. Let's pray together. Almighty God, you are the sovereign over all nations. Kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall, but your name stands above them all. As we approach election day in the United States of America, keep our eyes fixed on you. Help us to see what John saw in Revelation. Your throne is at the center of the universe, and beside the throne stands the Lamb who was slain. Jesus, your loving and sacrificial death is the victory that overcame evil. Your resurrection is the reason we have hope for life beyond death, for new creation coming, and for the restoration of all things. We pray for your rule to arrive on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for your will to be done in the world. We pray for the church in America to reflect the kingdom of God in all that we do and say. Help us to be salt. Help us to be light. No matter the outcome of this election, fill us, your people, with your peace. Remind us of our mission in the world. Keep us faithful to our call and joyful in your service. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and faith so that you overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, I hope you can join us tomorrow night as we pray together as a church family. I know you'll be praying, and if 
And if you have not exercised your right to vote, do that and do that in accordance with your own conscience, praying for God to give you direction on how it best can be used to promote his kingdom and his righteousness in the world. Um, you'll see an image on the screen here. Uh, anybody know who this is? His nickname is the cellist of Sarajevo. Anybody heard of the cellist of Sarajevo? In 1992, when I was a senior in college, this man, Vedran Smailovic, um, was, uh, he's the principal cellist in the Sarajevo Orchestra. Um, there was the war going on. Some of you know about that. You remember that. I didn't pay much attention to world events in those days because I was young and in college, and also because this is before everything was always available online in your face all the time. Most of us were pretty ignorant about what was happening around us, around the world. But in this part of the world, in Sarajevo, there was the breakup of the, of the former Soviet uh, Republic of Yugoslavia, and there was a great war. Uh, Bosnian Serbs attacked this capital city of Sarajevo, shelling it for, for four months. And most of the city a month later was pretty much in ruins. Many people lost their lives. Uh, May 27th of 92, outside of the, one of the last remaining functioning bakeries in the city where people could get bread, there was a queue of people lined up 100 deep to get bread, and an artillery shell fell just outside of that bakery, uh, which is, he's sitting in the rubble of, smashing it to pieces, killing 22 people, injuring hundreds. Smilovich was just down the street, heard the explosion, and had friends that were in that line and raced to see if he could help, and he so, was so horrified and heartbroken by the carnage there they wanted to do something. But what could he do? He's a cellist. I mean, what can a cellist do about this horrific war happening? So the next day, he showed up in the rubble. This is a picture of that day, wearing his, his tuxedo for, performance, for concert performances, carrying a small wooden stool and his cello. He sat in the rubble, and he played Adagio in G minor by some composer. I've forgotten his name. Anyway. And then he, he left. He came back the next day and did the same thing. And the next day... And the next day, for 22 straight days, one day for every person who lost their life, he sat in the rubble and played that lament on his cello. And again, this is before the world knew everything within hours of when it happened. The, peace, the, the, the ceasefire and peace wouldn't come until uh, 1995, three and a half years later. But in, the retros in retrospect, those who worked for peace credited this man and his actions because it became like this symbol him sitting in the rubble playing his cello became a symbol of peace. And it went around the world. And they credited him for bringing exposure to what was happening there, the atrocities being committed that hastened the peace process. You know, I think, in a way, this is a symbol of what God calls all of his people to be and to do in the world. To use whatever we have, what gifts we have, even if, even if like, we don't think they make much difference, to work for peace. To be, in a sense, cellists of Sarajevo in our own neighborhoods. We see this in the Beatitude for this morning, Matthew 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. I don't know if you know this, but it's really hard to preach on one sentence. We talk about this in our preaching team meeting every Tuesday morning when we get together, and it's not because there's not enough material. It's actually because there's so much. Nobody could pack more into one sentence than Jesus. There's so much, and what, one of the challenges is what doesn't make it into the sermon because there's so much to be said about this simple sentence, but profound. So we're called as kingdom citizens to be peacemakers in a world of confusion and chaos and conflict. Conflict is not hard to find in this world. And you don't have to look to Gaza, Israel, Ukraine, or around the world to find conflict. You can look in your own family probably, in your own neighborhood, in our own state, in your own, in your own heart, and find conflict. But true, genuine peace is rare. A very rare thing. The first thing I want to talk about is the problem of peace. I don't just mean that, that, that the world is full of conflict and confusion. I mean our understanding of what peace is is a problem. Most of us think of peace in, in terms of like a ceasing the, the hostilities. Like, for example, when, when, I, when my kids were little, they're all grown now, but they'd be downstairs and they'd play with, with um, Playmobil figures. I don't know if that's a thing still. But we had castles and pirate ships and stuff everywhere, you know? And it was all set up. And they would argue about who got what. And sometimes I'd be upstairs trying to watch peacefully a ball game. And I could hear the chaos and confusion of the world in the basement. So I would have to descend as the great peacemaker from on high, come down to my children and sort out this mess that they're in, you know, by get, bringing peace to that situation. And what it really meant was like, stop stabbing your sisters, stop stealing your brother's toys, and okay, stop it, you know. That's not the Bible's vision of peace. 
that just, a, just ceasing the conflict. It's much more beautiful and profound and positive than that. The Greek word used here is the word arene. It means the harmony and tranquility. And it's really communicating something that comes out of the Old Testament Hebrew scriptures. How many of you know the Hebrew word for peace? Shalom. Turn to your neighbor and say, shalom. That's not just a greeting, although it is often used as a greeting. That, that word means uh, wholeness, joy, fullness, complete harmony and unity and tranquility, the way God designed the world to be and our relationship with him to be, complete, whole, perfect. And it's not. The point is the biblical vision of peace is about much more than just stop fighting, than just let's keep the peace. Rich Viotis, a pastor in, in Queens, New York, wrote, peacemaking is working for right relationships and human flourishing, shalom, in other words, at the expense of our own comfort. But the problem of peace runs deeper than just the external conflicts we see and experience in our families, in our state, in our nation, in the world. It runs deeper, right deep into our own hearts. Several months ago, I had a chance to take a prayer retreat to a monastery. I'm not a monk, nor am I Catholic, but it was a good experience for me. For three and a half days, almost four days, I didn't say more than 12 words, except for calling my wife at night, which is very unusual for me. <laughs> um, and it was, I did feel the connection with God there. And that monastery down in, uh, in near Louisville in Gethsemane, Kentucky, is, was the home for 30 years of a monk named Thomas Merton. You may have heard of him. He's written a great deal about the spiritual life. Here's something he said that's helped me on this point. We are not at peace with others because we are not at peace with ourselves. And we are not at peace with ourselves because we are not at peace with God. I think in a few sentences, he simply but profoundly diagnoses the issue. The problem of peace is not out there. It's in here. And it begins in here. Whatever unrest I feel in the world with my relationships is, is, is because I'm not really at peace with myself. And that's not possible because I don't have peace with God. I'm not reconciled to him. I don't know the peace of Christ that passes all understanding, as Paul says. This begins by facing the fact that in our hearts, apart from Christ, we are not at peace with God. In the Old Testament, the prophet Jeremiah is writing to God's people, and he's, he's warning them about false prophets who proclaim to them a message of peace that is not really a message of peace, a false message. He says this, for from the least to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. Sounds a little like American political landscape today. And from prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. They have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace, where well, there is no peace. Beware, he says, of those who promise a, a cheap and easy peace that is not real and lasting and transformative. In the New Testament, James, who says things pretty bluntly, puts it this way, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. I know that some of you might be thinking, whoa, whoa, time out. I'm not an enemy. I mean, I'm kind of neutral on the whole God thing. I mean, I believe in him in general, but I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm not, the scriptures are pretty clear. There is no such thing as a neutral position when it comes to God. You're either reconciled to him in Christ, his child, or whether you want to see it or not, you're against him. You are at enmity with him. Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter two, a great chapter on this subject, writes this about our condition apart from Christ. Remember, he says, that you were at that time, I mean apart from Jesus, separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's not a good description of a condition you wanna be in. Separated from Christ, without hope, without God in the world. But he goes on and talks about the amazing thing that Christ has done to solve the problem of peace. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ for he himself is our peace. That is a line worth remembering and repeating to yourself over and again. He himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, therefore, thereby killing the hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. This enmity, this hostility between us and God 
Jesus has dealt with by destroying it, by killing it in his body on the cross. And therefore, he's our peace. And all peacemaking begins there. In other words, we must face the fact that we're not at peace with God if we're going to have peace with God. Like this first step to getting healthy is to admit that you're sick. I, I, I've shared this before, but I have, this, I have had a number of knee surgeries. I've got about 20% of the cartilage you're supposed to have in my right knee. And I've been for a couple of years now pretending that, you know, as I get older, it will heal itself. It will magically get better. You know what's happening? It's not. It's getting worse, right? The first step toward not limping around like an old man is admitting I got a problem. I need to have it addressed. Spiritually speaking, we have, there are people walking around thinking we're fine, and you're not, and you're not. And if you pause and examine your own heart and let God speak to you deep down, you know you're not. He himself is our peace. He's the foundation of peace. And that's why we can be called a people of peace. The people of peace. We're called to be this, who experience peace with God through Christ, who share the gospel of peace with the world around us, and who work for peace in the world. But it begins in our relationship with God through Christ. Look at verse uh, 9 of Matthew 5 once more. Blessed are the peacemakers, and look at the promise. I love this part. For they will be called children of God. That's incredible what Jesus says. When you work for peace in the world, you look like your father in heaven. This is a family trait to be peacemakers. I see some, lots of you walking in with your kids, and I love to see your little, your cute little, my kids are all grown now, but your cute little kids and how they look like mom and dad. There's a sense in Jesus saying, when you live this way, with the peace of Christ and for the peace of Christ in the world, you look like your father. You resemble the one who made you in his image, and you'll be recognized as such. doesn't mean the world always sees you that way. Sometimes peacemaking is a thankless job, and you can work hard for it, and people look down their nose or ignore you or even criticize you. But it means God sees. Christ sees. He recognizes, and he knows whose son or daughter you are when you do that. Peacemaking is a family trait. My mom used to say to me certain things that we don't do that as Frasers. That's not how we are, or that's what, this, this is how we are. Like on the negative side, I, I had uh, a large appetite as a young boy, and we'd go to other people's houses for dinner. My mom would always be like, Jeffrey, go last. Jeffrey, go last. I hated that. <laughs> <laughs> Frasers, Frasers, go last. What do you mean last? <laughs> it's not how we are as Frasers. Jesus say on the positive side, this is how we are. This is how my children are. They work for peace because they have peace with me through the cross. Now keep in mind, Jesus said this to people living under Roman occupation, Roman oppression, heavily taxed, brutally treated. The average Jew of Jesus' day did not think peacemaking with Rome was a good idea at all. They hated the Romans. They wanted them to throw them out and destroy them. They were the oppressors. They are the evil empire. They are the, the problem in the world. Peace, making peace, not with them, not with them. Surely you can't mean that, Jesus. In fact, there was a group, a sect within Judaism called the Zealots. In fact, one of Jesus' 12 disciples was named Simon the Zealot. The Zealots were, uh, they think Pharisees theologically with a militaristic strategy laid on top of it. They were serious about keeping the law. They were sold out about the religious law, the Old Testament law, and they were militant about keeping it. And they believed you could bring about God's kingdom by, by violence, military force, to throw out the Romans. In that culture, Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they're my children, for they look like their father. You'll see an image here on the screen of uh, what we sometimes refer to as the Pax Romana. On the right, that's Caesar Augustus. The Pax Romana is Latin for the peace of Rome. Uh, and it was uh, really a remarkable period. It lasted from about 27 BC when Augustus took power to about 180 AD when Marcus Aurelius, uh, at the end of his reign. In that span of over 200 years there, there was, um, there was relative peace and tranquility in the empire. There were roads, common language, Koine Greek, safety, relative safety, culture flourished, architecture, art, literature, commerce, these things all flourished. Now, it wasn't always peaceful if you were a person under subjugation by Rome, but there was relative peace in the empire. But here's a question. How was the Pax Romana? Which, by the way, we read in the New Testament that the gospel, at, at Paul says at just the right time, at the fullness of time, God came. 
his missionary journeys would not have been possible if it wasn't for the Pax Romana. If there wasn't ease of travel and, and language to communicate in, the spread of the gospel couldn't have happened. So there's a lot to be thankful for. But how was it accomplished? How did Rome establish such remarkable peace in the world? What do you think? The sword. Bloodshed. They kept peace by violently putting down anybody who threatened it. Like that's how the Pax Romana was established and kept. We wipe out violently with bloodshed those who would come against it. How is the peace of God established? Bloodshed. Not yours, his. It's all the difference in the world. And in this place, in this context, Jesus says, we're to be people of peace. Colossians chapter three, verses 14 through 15. Above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. It's tempting to read this as an individual uh, word. Like, let peace of Christ, in, like your inner peace, so you as a person. That's true. But Paul is writing to a church, a collection of believers like this. And he's saying, in one body, let Christ, the peace of Christ rule in your hearts collectively. In here, in this body and be thankful. Kingdom citizens have the peace of Christ ruling in their hearts. We're, we, you know, we're conditioned to think that if my candidate is not in power, if my party is not calling the shots, if things don't go economically the way I think they should go, if the world doesn't get sorted out with all these uh, wars, then I can't have peace. And that's completely antithetical to what the Bible teaches us. It's because we have peace, unshakable, unchangeable peace with God through Christ, that it doesn't matter. I mean, on an ultimate scale, it matters, but it's not ultimately going to change what I have in Christ. Peace with God. Nothing can take that. And, and God has always intended for his people to be missionaries of peace, as it were. Walter Kaiser wrote a book called Mission in the Old Testament, Israel as a Light to the Nations. Uh, in it, he, he, it's, it's somewhat, when he wrote it, it was somewhat controversial because people didn't see Israel as a missionary movement, but he makes the case that from the beginning, God was calling a people to himself to be an instrument of his peace and grace and light in the world. Here's what Kaiser writes. In fact, the whole purpose of God in the Old Testament was that he would make a nation, give them a name and bless them so they might be a light to the nations and therefore a blessing to the whole world. To shrink back from this would have been sin on Israel's part. Israel was to be God's missionary to the world. And so are we, the church. The mission has not changed. Ultimately speaking, God's people in the world, now the church, is meant to be peace bringers, peacemakers in the world. The spread of the gospel of the kingdom was never to be, uh, it never happened by force or coercion or positions of power. You can look throughout Christian history and every time Christians were in the halls of, of, of economic and political power, it did not go well for the gospel. But through humility, love, service, and peacemaking, this brings us to the path of peace. There's a big difference between being a peacekeeper and a peacemaker. Do you know the difference? Some of you, are, we're gonna have Thanksgiving pretty soon. You're gonna have family over or you're gonna travel to be with family. And I'm guessing there's at least a, a half of you or maybe more that have some members of your family who you'll be together with for Thanksgiving that you're gonna like, okay, gotta prepare ourselves. Gotta get mentally ready for this one. Don't bring up certain subjects. Don't talk about that. He's, you know how he, she is. And you're gonna have to like keep the peace, right? You're gonna have to go through this, this engagement with the family, this event, and try to keep the peace by avoiding certain things. Maybe in your own home, it's like that. Maybe with some people, your neighbors, it's like that. Like, don't touch this fence. You know, he's about, she's about her flowers. So like, keep the peace. Like, my neighbors have, well, I won't say. Never mind. <laughs> that, that's peacekeeping. By avoiding conflict to have a surface level, level superficial peace. Biblical peacemaking is the willingness to walk through the hard things, through the conflict, in order to come out the other side and have God reconcile and heal. Willing to say and hear hard things, willing to offer forgiveness and grace, willing to deal with things that are difficult, not just avoid them so we don't have to, let's, can we all just get along? Romans 14, verses 17 through 19. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. 
Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. It doesn't mean there's no eating and drinking in God's kingdom. There's feasting and joy. What he's saying is not superficial. Righteousness, joy, and peace. So then let's live that way as kingdom citizens. Let's do the things that make for peace. This next passage in Romans chapter 12, I have thought about, prayed about, and shared more times than I could count as a pastor with people who are in conflict. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. That last sentence, if possible, as far as it depends on you, Live peaceably with all. If possible. As much as you're able, as it depends on you. And the truth is, it's not all, it's not all up to you, is it? When it comes to making peace with, with individuals, they have a part to play in this. I mean, if you're in conflict with somebody, you can confess your sin, you can uh, communicate clearly the, the, the harm done or the, the issue, the tension. You can approach with all humility and prayer the best you can, and they might be, I don't want to hear it. Like you, you're not, It's not all up to you to make peace. In a, in a relationship, in your community, in the world. But if possible, and sometimes it is possible, and as far as it depends on you, which might only be 10%, but do your 10%, like the cellist of Sarajevo, what can I do? I don't know, I could play. Maybe, that, maybe, I'll, maybe my lament will get through to people. I think the temptation, and I have this too, is to think, yeah, but you don't know, I know what she's going to say. I know how he is. It's not going to go anywhere. It's just going to make things more tense. This isn't worth it. And so we shrink back. But what, what if all of us took seriously when Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers who, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Well, Lord, what can I do? What can I do to communicate your gospel of peace in this situation? From the beginning, this is how God intended his gospel to spread and for people to impact the world. Not by mandates from positions of power, but by peacemaking. Our friend John Dixon wrote in his great book, Bullies and Saints, uh, puts it this way. In the original vision of the New Testament, the principal means for doing God's work in the world are prayer, persuasion, service, and suffering for the sake of the gospel. He says, those are the four tools God gave his people in the New Testament and the early church, and they're still the tools we have today. Prayer, persuasion, service, and suffering for the sake of the gospel. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't want to vote for or lobby for or advocate for policies that bring human flourishing, that protect life, that promote the kingdom of God and all of its values. We should, of course we should. But the fundamental tools are not positions of power. They're prayer, persuasion, service, and suffering. Reminds me of a story uh, of, a, of a martyr um, named St. Tele Telemachus. I don't know if it's Telemachus or Telemachus, but I'm gonna say Telemachus because you don't know and neither do I. <laughs> yeah, he was a, an ascetic hermit monk uh, in the, about, about 400 uh, AD. We don't know anything about him until he shows up in Rome around 404. Shows up in Rome as this hermit monk who'd been living in a life of prayer and solitude and isolation in, in, the, in the capital, in Rome. And uh, now, at this time, the, the gladiatorial games had been officially banned um, by Theodoret I, but nobody cared. They kept doing them because the people loved it. And his son, uh, Honorius, was the, was the emperor. And the games are going on, and Telemachus comes to the Colosseum and sees this scene of just bloodshed and brutality. People just being wiped out by the sword and 50,000 people cheering for this. And he's so moved in his spirit that he climbs over the railing down into the arena of the Colosseum. And he, he starts to plead with the gladiators who are in the middle of combat to lay down their swords. He starts to pray and cry out to God to intervene. He pleads with the, 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 the Roman officials that were presiding over it and the crowds. And they're jeering him and mocking him. And he's begging for it to stop. And one of the gladiators, frustrated, just runs him through with the sword and kills him right there in the arena. And the, according to the story, the Colosseum falls silent. And the emperor honors him by making him a saint, 
have you feast in his honor. And that was the last gladiatorial contest in the Colosseum by his death. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's a cool story, and I like history, but I'm no martyr. Well, fair enough, neither am I. None of us, n- nobody chooses to be or wants to be and like pursues it. But the same tools available to the first Christians who changed the world are available to us. Fervent prayer. Open, honest persuasion, like communicating clearly with humility the great gospel of Jesus Christ. Service in the name of Jesus Christ. And suffering if need be. Because ultimately, we may be peacemakers, but in the end, we don't establish peace. Jesus does. The Prince of Peace. Finally, the Prince of Peace. We'll celebrate this in a few weeks when we get to Advent from Isaiah 9. He's called the Prince of Peace, but he in himself is shalom, wholeness, fullness, unity, harmony, and joy. In Colossians 1, 19 through 20, we're told this, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. He made peace so we can be peacemakers in the world. And it's like all of our efforts at peacemaking sort of sit between the peace Christ made on the cross and the ultimate peace that will fill the earth when he returns. So in between, we work for peace. And I think I just want want you to pause for a minute. We're going to come to the communion table in a moment. And just think about that. If you know Jesus, if you know him, if you've surrendered your life to him, if you've experienced the forgiveness and grace that he offers then you have peace with God. Your soul is at peace with God. Nothing can change that. Nothing can take that away from you, ever. No matter what happens in the world, it cannot be shaken. It cannot be undone because he made it. It's not accomplished by any human effort, but by Christ's blood on the cross. And it also means the spirit comes and resides in our hearts and speaks words of peace to us in a world full of turmoil. And it also means that we know he will return in the same way he went and establish peace. That is peace. From that place, I think God calls us to be peacemakers in the world. As your pastor, this is what I want for you. Many of you, I've had many, many conversations over the last couple of months with you uh, about this election. I've had many email exchanges with some of you. And, we've had, and I've agonized over it. Like, what should be said from the pulpit? And what, what do God's people need to hear? And there's lots of different opinions in this very room about that. And every time I pray about it and think about it and are challenged by some of you, the Lord keeps bringing me back to this. I'm no pundit. I'm no political expert. I'm your pastor. And my job is to point you to the Prince of Peace, to what matters, to what lasts. I care about this election in two days. I know you do. I'll be praying for our nation. But but what you need is to be reconciled to God in Christ, to have the spirit come reside in your hearts and to live with that undergirding of peace in a world that's just, who knows how it's gonna go. I'll tell you right now, the polls don't know. CNN doesn't know. Fox News doesn't know. There's only one who knows. And it isn't me. And it isn't whoever you're watching on YouTube. It's Christ on the throne. He knows and he holds it. And he himself is our peace. So I want to leave you before we come to communion with the words John, Jesus gave his disciples in John 14, shortly before he would leave this world. These things I've spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the helper of the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, Neither let them be afraid. The peace offered to us in Christ is not like the world's peace. The world's peace is temporary. It's partial. It can't heal. It can't restore. The peace offered to us in Christ can and does. And so I want you to pull out your communion cup if you have it. If you didn't get one, please put your hand up. We have ushers ready to come bring that to you. Just put your hand up. They'll come bring it to you and make sure everyone is served. And as you hold this in your hand, I want to remind you of something. Some of you might be new to Chapel Street. Maybe you're not a member. Maybe you're not a regular tender. Maybe it's your first time here. You're welcome at his table if two things are true about you. If, number one, you've trusted in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. You know he's forgiven you. 
and you know he's your only hope now and for all eternity. And number two, you're willing to examine your own heart so that you don't eat and drink in an unworthy manner. If that's true of you, then he welcomes you to his table. It's not our table. Sometimes communion is used in the church or has been historically as an instrument of division to determine who's in and who's out. I don't think that's what Jesus intended. I think it's an invitation to trust him and to know him. And if you have, then you're welcome. Let's pray and prepare our hearts. Lord Jesus, you are our peace. You have removed the barrier between us and you by giving your very life. You've forgiven our sin. You've secured our future. You've flooded our hearts with grace and given us your spirit. And now as we come to your table, through these simple elements of bread and cup, just to remember the power of your love and the depth of your sacrifice, we thank you, Jesus, our Prince of Peace. Amen. If you pull off that bottom layer and hold the bread in your hands, I remind you of Jesus' words at that last supper. He said, to his disciples as he broke bread. This is my body. It is given for you. Eat this in his memory. If you peel off that top layer, I remind you that Jesus said after they'd eaten, he poured out a cup and he said, this covenant is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. And every time we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim his death, his resurrection, and his kingdom until he comes again. Let's do that together. Amen. As always, if you're here this morning and you would like someone to pray with you, feel free to meet us in the back in the glass room. Just happy to pray for you and pray with you for whatever you're facing in this life. Now, brothers and sisters, May the peace of Christ guard your minds and hearts in the Lord Jesus. May the love of God and the fellowship of the Spirit and the grace of Christ be with you now and for always. Amen.